Good morning, everyone. It is a good morning, isn't it? Yes. All right. Uh, bright day outside. Uh, a bit ironic in that we're talking about a very hard and difficult subject today. Our budget. And as most of you know, we're very deep into our budget season right now. And I believe that it's very important that we begin a frank and forward discussion of our options in dealing with what is a very tough fiscal challenge. It's important because of the potential impacts on our future as a community. We have to take a realistic look at where we are and where we want to go. It has to be grounded in a genuine assessment of what is possible. We cannot be seduced by the siren song that we can have it all with no sacrifice or that a magic bullet exists someplace that will make all of our problems disappear. Our conversation has to be about hard facts. And the hard fact is that our budget has a stubborn structural imbalance. Despite our four years of implementing more reorganizations and more job cuts than any other mayoral administration in the city's history, we still face a $9.3 million deficit. This is the toughest budget since I've taken office. The hard fact is that our options are limited in dealing with the problem. Our personnel costs are 70% of the budget, yet the state has severely limited our ability to control wage increases by mandating that we pay comparable wages. Our revenue sources are limited by the state and thus unable to keep pace with inflationary costs. Both the state and federal governments have reduced state aid programs. And for far too long, we have relied upon one-time funds to solve the problem. The hard fact is that we must either adequately fund the programs that we value with ongoing revenues and ongoing revenue streams, or we must cut additional programs. Many contend that we can have it all, that we simply need to be more efficient. I certainly agree that we should strive for efficiency. And that's why over time we have completed reorganization and restructuring in departments each and every year for the past four years. The evidence is clear. Despite city growth in population and in area by over 6% during my administration, we have cut the number of employees by over 5%. That figure is 8% if you look at only employees outside of public safety. We are clearly doing more with less, which is the very definition of efficiency, and we will continue to do so. But I must emphasize that efficiency gains alone will not solve our current problem. The hard fact remains that the deficit is 6% of our general fund. And that has a double digit impact in reality because many big ticket items like pension commitments and bond payments cannot be cut. With four years of program reductions to non-essential services behind us, and considering that 50% of the budget is dedicated to public safety, which we have essentially held harmless up to now, the low-hanging fruit is clearly gone. The purpose of the information that we're releasing today is solely this. We must fully and thoroughly understand the consequences of solving a 9.3 million deficit with only program cuts. We need to understand what that means. The public needs to understand what that means. 
That's why we placed a program prioritization on the city website that we've worked on since the beginning of the administration so that people can better visualize the challenge. And today I'm taking this one step further. We are releasing a one-dimensional cuts-only budget scenario that demonstrates what programs would be eliminated if we solve the deficit strictly with cuts. Let me be clear. We will not seek to solve this year's budget with this type of approach only. But it is essential to understand the consequences if we did choose that course. The cuts only budget is based on the program prioritizations. For those programs where cuts were either intenable or clearly unwise, we made a note on the handouts to you why we didn't follow the priority list. The results demonstrate the seriousness of the situation. For example, the police department would lose 13 positions, including six officers, four parking uh, officers that serve our neighborhoods, and three victim witness advocates. It would take longer for police to respond to neighborhood parking issues and non-emergency complaints and we would no longer take publicly intoxicated people into protective custody. Our library service model would be altered. Three libraries would close. The remaining five li libraries would be closed one day a week, and three hours would be eliminated from Sunday service. The popular One Book, One Lincoln program and the youth literacy programs would end. Fire station number 11 that serves the airport community would close, eliminating 12 firefighters. And we would reorganize stations over the next two years to restore proper response times to the northwestern sector of town. Station 11 had only 332 calls last year, less than one a day. By contrast, Station 1 had over 6,000 calls last year. In a cuts-only budget, it is difficult to justify the expense of keeping a station open that receives less than one call a day. Parks create an, an outstanding quality of life for the community, but represent lower priority city spending when compared to public safety, and the protection of public health and well-being. As a result, Parks takes massive cuts in a cuts-only scenario. We would have to adopt what other communities have gone to already, where neighborhood parks are eliminated in favor of large regional parks. Over 90 parks would be closed, leaving only four large parks and one historic park, Hazel Abel. All city pools, except those that could generate income, would be closed, leaving only Star City Shores and Woods to serve the entire city. Recreation centers and street tree maintenance would be seriously reduced. Pioneers Park Nature Center could no longer continue. Those who use public transportation would see unwelcome cuts. Star Trans Saturday service would be ended, <coughs> Weekday mid midday service from approximately 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. would be eliminated. Many who depend on StarTran to get to work, school, and other necessities of daily living could face serious transportation problems. Funds that, funds that help retain and create jobs would be reduced. Aging services to our seniors would be greatly curtailed with over a half a million dollars in cuts. Prenatal care referral and other pregnancy related support programs would end. But that's not everything. You have just heard about the most prominent cuts, those most noticeable to the public. The spreadsheet that's being handed out to you details a host of other program eliminations and reductions. 
I need to emphasize again, and for you to properly convey to the public, that this one-dimensional budget is not the one I will release on July 11th. I offer this today, this information, this important information, because without understanding where a cuts-only budget will take us, we cannot make proper judgments on alternatives to a cuts-only budget solution. Let me address for a moment some of the second guessing that will no doubt follow this presentation. Some will immediately blame the construction of the Haymarket Arena. We would have this problem whether or not the arena was built. Remember that general fund sources of revenue do not fund the West Haymarket Arena project. In fact, the arena is one of the solutions to our budget problems to keep them from reoccurring. The construction of the arena, the development of surrounding businesses, and the new entertainment options will generate new growth in our sales tax base, helping us meet future budget challenges. Some will suggest that deep cuts in the fire department will solve the problem. While I agree that we should strive for greater efficiencies in all areas of city government, can we really risk the safety of the community on emergency response changes that are untested and perhaps are based more on politics than on the sci science of covering the city properly? Others will, will point to StarTran and say we can prioritize the service and do it far cheaper. The City Council, with our support, has asked the City's Audit Committee to examine other service models in hopes of identifying better systems. That work is still in the future. Some will accuse us of trying to scare the public. Frankly, that concerned me as well, and I had a number of second thoughts about this particular presentation and the release of the list. But we have a responsibility to realistically confront the choices available to us. To me, it is far more frightening to ignore the situation and place our hopes in unrealistic schemes with uncertain outcomes. And our entire program prioritization is now and has been completely transparent. If a citizen believes there are other cuts to be made, we would ask them to go to the city website that lists all 224 of the city programs and tell us what they would change instead. As our annual public engagement efforts suggest, we are certainly interested in a thorough and lively public discourse on our budget. What everyone has to realize and what the cuts only budget scenario demonstrates is that there are no easy answers. We face tough choices, but we face them secure in the knowledge that Lincoln is a growing and thriving, high quality community. Our repeated successes in the national rankings demon demonstrate time and time again that both our present and our future is very bright. That's why I cannot in good conscience alter that future to the extent of a cuts only budget, to the extent suggested by this list that is being passed out today. To follow this path would be a repudiation of all we have stood for over time as a community. It would be a rejection of the toil and sacrifice of those who have come before us. We have a great city today because of what has been done by those who have come before us and by their promises made and kept. Each generation 
quietly but firmly and confidently has committed to their children and to their grandchildren that this place will be better for them. I will not be the mayor that allows Lincoln to stand still or fall behind because I lack the political will or courage to lead. Yes, we will have to make cuts. Yes, we will have to make sacrifices. These have been the most difficult of economic times. But I refuse to let those cuts and sacrifices become so deep that our essential character as a city is changed. You will hear my budget plan for our future on July 11th, coming up shortly. That plan, for probably the first time in this century, will give us a structurally balanced budget using no one-time money. In the meantime, let's talk candidly and forthrightly about what we all want for Lincoln's future. I look forward to that discussion and I invite every citizen to join in the conversation. So there you go. I hope you can take to the public uh, this information which describes one of the parameters, one of the ending points uh, on the continuum of solutions that are possible in this situation. Okay, questions? Mayor, will you propose an increase in the property tax levy? You know, we <clears throat> what we're giving you today is a one-dimensional solution, obviously. What we will propose, and we're still at this late moment, still working on the budget, what we propose will be a multi-dimensional solution. Does that mean a property tax increase would be included then? That we're not prepared at this point in time to describe the entire budget. I would like for you all to try to get the public to focus on one aspect of it. If we try to get the public to focus on everything at once, we will not succeed in educating the public on all of the different aspects of the problem. Well, Mayor, don't you think the public looking at this budget then will assume that that does mean a property tax increase? I mean, that'll be their natural assumption when they see these dramatic cuts that would have to take place without it? Well, I don't make any assumptions about what the public's going to think. What we're trying to do today is to describe one end of the continuum, the cut side of the continuum. I suppose, in a theoretical sense, if you wanted to describe the other side of the continuum, uh, a total revenue scenario, and if you took what is probably in most people's minds the worst case of, of revenue increases, property tax increases, that extreme on the other side would theoretically require a six cent property tax increase which amounts to about $7.50 a month for taxpayers. That's what it would be if your solution was to solve the entire $9.3 million with property taxes. So you have, you have these dimensions, and that's what we're trying to get the public to understand. What you pay, what the cost is, what the sacrifices are, get them to think about where they want to be on uh, a continuum that involves a multi a multi dimensional solution. And Mayor, um, should the Air Park Fire Station stay open if it has one call a day? You said it has one call a day. Is that an error? It has one call. Yeah. Should it stay less open? Less than one call a day. Should it stay open if it has less than one call a day? Well, I mean, these are all uh, topics to be discussed. Uh, the reorganization of fire stations. Uh, this, this gets into a deeper problem in the sense that it's been a long, long time since we've reorganized the location of fire stations. We have work to do in that area uh, because they are not located now uh, in such a configuration as to maximize the possibility of, of uh, response times, <coughs> low response times. 
uh, periodically in, a, in a, a city's history, you have to make changes to these locations. These kinds of changes are expensive, though, and involve investment as well as the curtailment of services in a particular location. Uh, we think we could deal with that station in the context of uh, larger change over a two-year time period. But that's, we, we put that on the list because in our judgment, in a system of prioritization, uh, you finally get to police and fire. You know, this whole public safety sector, almost 50% of our budget, we have essentially held harmless. Uh, and now we're to the point where we need to tell the public we, we can't hold them harmless because the destruction to other departments is too massive by doing that. If I could ask you too, Mayor, you mentioned the possibility of eliminating some library branches. Uh, how is library usage right now at this time period with the internet being so um, utilized by people and so on? Are you seeing an overall decrease of the library usage and are you seeing a dramatic decrease of these particular branches? You know, I don't, Pat, you want to comment on that? Sure, would it be Why don't you, please come up here so that everybody can hear you. At this point in terms of library use in the era of the internet and books for e-readers, we're continuing to see, I would say, maintenance of library use. So in terms of book circulation, circulation of books on CDs, and certainly, too, the library makes available books for e-readers, and we can't keep up with the demand for those. This summer, we're seeing over 13,000 people in our summer reading program. It looks like our biggest summer ever for that, as well as attendance at our special events is as high as it's ever been. So in terms both of circulation of materials and participation in the programs that we serve, we are still seeing about the same level as we were before or more. Mayor, there, you know, there, okay. there seems to be, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of, of sensational cuts uh, on, on these documents. Um, some other things that I'm curious if, if they're being looked at that maybe aren't uh, as much in the public eye, in, unless they're categorized differently. I'm not seeing, for example, cuts to um, uh, the, the city's law department or maybe urban development or something that, that maybe wouldn't normally be a front page <coughs> cut. The, the prioritization that we've done over the last four years, Kobe, has tried to accurately identify the need for certain types of services and programs. And we've laid that all out. Uh, sure, a cut to the law department would be less visible. But I know as manager of the city that at a certain point, a cut to the law department has tremendously detrimental effects. It means such things as they're unable to press lawsuits that they should press. They're unable to properly defend lawsuits that they should defend. Uh, they're incapable of giving advice in a timely manner. All of these things are essential to keeping costs down in city government. And the average citizen doesn't see that at a very visible level, but that doesn't mean it's less important because the average citizen doesn't see it. I have to take a look at it from the point of view of actually managing the city, and I need a law department that, can, that has enough people to function properly. Otherwise, all other departments are diminished by the lack of legal services. You know, and I, I just wanted to make one more comment. I, I have been... Uh, uh, surprised by, by how acute problems have been in some other cities across the nation. And, you know, I, I said some people are going to see this as scare tactics, but it's not. There's a reality out there uh, that uh, looks seriously at radical kinds of solutions. Uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, the Parks Department in Colorado Springs last year 
its budget was reduced from 17 million to 3 million in one year. Uh, four community centers and three museums were shut down or changed over to uh, trying to survive on private donations or emergency public funds. Uh, and it's not just the parks. Uh, Colorado Springs, uh, for example, cut 550 employees from its workforce. And that's a city that's the same size as Lincoln in terms of its workforce. Uh, huge, huge cuts. Uh, of the, it says of the 1,600 municipal employees that were left after that cut of 550, uh, of the 1,600, 1,200 of them were police officers or firefighters. So there are, there are options out there, and people need to understand what happens when these options are exercised. Are there indications of the revenue coming into the city, how it's tracking as far as sales taxes? It's been increasing. Is it continuing that or in that pattern? Yeah, up until the last month, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but it, it has been increasing uh, over last year. It's up about 4.5% in that area. So we're starting to see revival uh, with respect to that particular revenue source. Property taxes, however, valuations remain very, very flat and unhelpful. All right. Thank you very much. I did just confirm with Steve Hutka that if you did go on the other end of that spectrum and cover the whole